morning, church family. How we doing? Today we are uh, we're launching a six week series in the book of Nehemiah. Um, and is there more house light? Because I feel like I can't quite see them. It feels brighter than usual in my face as well. I don't know if there's a way we can make some adjustments there. Whoa. <laughs> I love you guys. Tech team, you guys are awesome. Um, the, the book of Nehemiah is, is mostly written, that is much better by the way, thank you. Um, uh, it's mostly written in the first person, which would suggest that Nehemiah is uh, not only the key person in our story here, but also uh, he's likely our author. Now, Nehemiah is going to tell us the story of Israel uh, and, and their effort to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And, and let me just kind of set the stage really for what's going on, because there's there's a lot of things that we can discuss and, and a lot of things that we can really unpack as we just roll through this story. But I need you to know that the goal of this series is simple, and it's going to remain the focus throughout. And you're going to hear me say this a lot. The church needs more Nehemiahs. Like, I, I just, I could not shake that call this week. Like, the church is not in need of more Judas Iscariots, Okay. The, 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 the church doesn't need more Pontius Pilots. The church is not in need of more Pharisees or self-proclaimed prophets. What the church needs is more Nehemiahs. This church needs more Nehemiahs. That hit me this week because, you see, God's, God desires for us that, that we all participate together in the building of his kingdom. That's our call. And God needs more men and women to rise and build and really, I just wanted to open with that because I think a lot of times, right, we, we, we pick up our Bibles and, and we look at a story like Nehemiah, yet here we are in the United States of America and we ask ourselves, and I think it's a fair question really, what in the world does this story written 2,500 years ago have to do with me? What does this mean for me? And the truth is, if you were to look at this story, if you were to look at the book of Nehemiah as just another build project, then you're going to miss the answer to that question. If you were to flip to the end of the book of Nehemiah right now, you'd see that after the wall is finished, sorry, spoiler alert, the wall will be finished. After that, if you were to, if you were to flip to the end, right, you'll see that after the temple is rebuilt by Zerubbabel, af after God's standards of community are reestablished through Ezra, and after Nehemiah rebuilds the walls, still, after all that, something's missing. Something's missing. The, 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 the people, their hearts, something's not right. And so they default back to the behaviors that led to their exile in the first place. Like, listen, you need to understand, folks, that God has not designed us to operate in the shadows. We're not, that's not who we are. Matthew 5, 14 says, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We talk about this a lot around here. We're not we're not called to be private Christians. We're called to be public Christians. And Jesus says that his people actually live in two cities, not just one. So there's the city you live in, right? A5086, A5087, A5085, wherever it is online. I'm sure we got some fun zip codes there. Like whatever, wherever you represent, whatever, that's the city you live in, but then you belong to another city. So you live in a city and you belong to a city. Jesus says that the city you belong to is not the one you live in. It's the church. See, the church is a city filled with people that are obedient to God's word, obedient to his commands. We seek to live changed and holy lives so that the God of the cosmos, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, will be praised forever. That's who we are. That's the city that we belong to. And so we do. We live in a city, and yes, there is darkness in that city. But we belong to another city, and it's called the church, and there is light just radiating from that city. At least they're supposed to be. Now, there's an important distinction to make here. Okay? You aren't called to point out that there's darkness. You're called to shine light on it. Right? So, so, so let's be careful here, because you're called uh, to shine light on it, not to expose it, but to eliminate it. See, this is where a lot of folks, they get kind of sideways. And, and, and if I'm being honest, if I'm being completely transparent with you this morning, I, I, I'm guilty of this attitude as well. It's, it's, it goes something like this. 
you know what this church really needs? Like, you know, Josh is great and all, and, you know, Crossroads Cares is cool. I haven't met a need yet, but it's a, I mean, it's a cool idea. What, what, this, really, what this church really needs is this. What, what's really missing from this church is, is that. Or maybe it's not that for you. Maybe, oh, can you believe our elected officials? Right? And, and, and so this is, right, this is what we hear in, in life groups and ministry events. When believers gather, these are the things that we, we talk about. It's unbelievable. They're, these are the sounds that murmur when believers talk amongst themselves. I can't believe that our government is doing this. It's corrupt and beyond repair. How come, how come no one's doing anything about this? What, what's going on? Who will do something? Or, man, our schools are in bad shape. Have you seen the curriculum? Do they, just, do they just let anyone teach these days? Someone should really do something about this. And so we do. We have no shortage of belly aches, complainers, self-proclaimed prophets, and armchair quarterbacks and bloggers. Why? Because it's easy to analyze. It's easy to scrutinize. It's easy to talk about all the problems of the world, and far too often Christians fall into this trap of thinking that they're purposed for that, 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 that their purpose is to analyze. But here's the thing show me a body of believers that is quick to analyze and slow to act, and I'll show you a building that is empty soon to follow. And even if it's not empty, it's ineffective. Give me half the people that will act and will do more than twice as much that they'll do nothing and just talk. I'll take half. See, what we really need are people who will not discuss a situation but will actually do something about it. I actually said this in my first sermon as this church's lead pastor in April of 2021. It's hard to believe that it was so long ago. At least it feels like it's a long time ago. And I said, look, the future of the Capital C Church is bleak. Like, I'm telling you, COVID revealed some nasty little truths about what the church had become. It really did. I think it did us a favor. And so I said, and the elders agreed, we said the future of the church, it depends on us being doers. Right? And, and, and we, so we said, we said, we're going to focus less on, on, on what we think that we ought to say, and we're going to focus more on what we know that we've been tasked to do. And so we got to work. And so, I, I, look, that's really the context of where this church is coming from and where, where we're going, okay? We have, we have a lot of new faces in this place. Um, it appears that God is, is growing this body, and I want to be really faithful to make sure that we point this out constantly, just so you guys are aware. This will be something that's always coming out. This is what we're after. And so we do. We say, you know what this church is missing? We point out these missing pieces with no desire or expectation of ourselves to be the solution. So we talk about what's missing or what's bad, or instead of reaching out to those who have been tasked to shepherd and lead the body and ask, how can I get to work? How can I help? How can you use me? And what you end up with is a church full of people who have a whole lot to say, but lack any real desire to be doers. Opinions abound but action is unseen, ineffective. And so we say, can you believe our elected officials? Again, so anxious and willing to point out what's wrong with no feeling of personal responsibility. We do. Believers are doing it. We, we chant about elections being unfair, but when an election is on the horizon, we fail to volunteer at our poll place. A volunteer is a poll worker. And, and so we do. We talk about the need for being a light, but we rarely consider how to actually do it. Right? So we say, can you believe how bad our schools have gotten? And we bicker and we complain and we, we talk about the curriculum and we badmouth teachers behind their backs. How about we volunteer our time to improve our local schools? Go to, go to a district committee meeting or, or, or go to a, a PTA meeting or a, a vote for your school board elections. Attend something, do anything, offer to support the teachers, go and talk to them, pray for them, ask how you can pray for them, pick up some shoes on your way and take them and say, give this to a kid in need. Like, look, my point is this, it, the city of the church 
It's not designed for you to huddle up on Sundays and talk about how bad things have gotten. Like, we're designed and we're purposed to be active in our communities and offer our time, our skill, and our resources to be the solution to those problems. And I want you to know that's what we're committed to be in this place. That's, that, that, that's the vision that we have for this church. We want to see what happens when a body of believers dedicates themselves to meeting the needs of the city they live in. And so if you, I know it took me a second to get there, but if you think about it like that, our context is not all that different from where we find Nehemiah. It's really not. See, Nehemiah saw a problem, and instead of complaining and bickering, he took action. See, Nehemiah knew that God wanted him to step in and inspire and lead the Jews to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Let me give you the backdrop here. Way before Nehemiah, God established a special covenant with the Jewish people. Genesis 22, verse 17. Look at it. It says, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Wow. What? It's a big promise. So, right? Because God outlines this glorious future for the nation of Israel starting with Abraham. Now, fast forward to the book of Exodus, and shortly after, God uses Moses to bring his people out of Egypt. He says this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And God told them repeatedly that he alone is worthy to be praised. But Israel, they didn't want to have it. They, they kept turning away from God again and again and again and worshiping false gods. And so the Lord raised up prophets to warn them, right? He told them over and over again, I'm the one true God. Stop worshiping idols. Stop it. And so God warned them that if they don't stop being disobedient, he's going to let another nation overtake them and hold them captive. In case you didn't know, God keeps his promises. They didn't listen. They're human, after all. And they continued in the ways, and one day, God gave them exactly what they desired. They were taken as captive by the Babylonians for 70 years. And so God was basically saying, hey, Israel, you want idols? Here you go. Here's 70 years in the capital city of idols. They were given a, a new song to sing, and it was not a song to the one true God. Man. Folks, you talk about being completely dismantled as a nation. I mean, great kings like David and Solomon built these great walls and temples and worshiped the Lord their God. But now all that's left is a burning pile of rubble and a 70-year all-expense-paid trip to idol land. After 70 years in Babylon, things began to improve. They turned around, and, and the Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem. But check this. This blew my mind this week. Some of them didn't return. See, some had found a home in Babylon, and they stayed there. Be careful where you're comfortable. You might be tempted to stay there as well. So there's three waves. Three waves of exiles that returned to Israel. Wave one happened in 536 B.C. Zerubbabel took about 50,000 Jews back to Jerusalem, and in, in 20 years, by, by 516, they had rebuilt the temple that Solomon built. Not as well, mind you, but it was rebuilt. The second wave was in 457 B.C. There was a revival under Ezra, and yet another return to the land that God had, had given his people. And then wave three is in 445 B.C. The walls are still torn down. The job has not been finished, and God is looking for a man who can finish the job and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, I love how God reminds us here that he can use anyone to do anything. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what your background is. God can use you to do anything. And so before you shy away from that task that seems too big, like it's just too big for you, remember the God you serve. 
and I love this too. The Lord, there's all these little nuggets in it. I love this. The, the Lord called a man that was serving among royalty in the unlikeliest of places, the palace of Babylon. <laughs> His name? Nehemiah. Any of you like to journal in here? We got any journalers? Awesome. This is cool. So we're about to read Nehemiah's journal, all right? Kind of makes you wonder what church would be like today if we read your journal out loud, huh? I'm just kidding. We won't do that, all right? Let's, let's pick up in, in verse 1. It says, The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Okay, so it's winter, November, December-ish, winter, 445 B.C. Nehemiah is working in the capital city, and he has some visitors come to see him, and, and they get on this discussion of the remnant on, of the exile that we just went over. And, and look at verse 3. They said to him, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. Look, this is pretty simple. A nation without walls cannot defend itself. Right? Especially, I mean, I guess you could say it matters less since we've developed an aerial warfare and things of that nature. Walls matter a little less, but they still matter. But back then, they really mattered. You had to, if you wanted to be taken seriously as a nation, and, and, and look, the nature of a wall is pretty simple, really, right? Like, it keeps things that you don't want in from getting in. It provides protection, stability, it deters attacks, it safeguards people from the inside, from people on the outside who seek to do them harm. Like, Look, bottom line, if you want to be taken seriously as a nation, even as a city, you need walls and you need men at those walls. And so Nehemiah just got word that Israel's walls are, are they're broken and, and the gates have been burned out. In other words, day-to-day -day life for the people of God was not going well. Things were not good. I mean, sure, the temple was rebuilt, but without any protection within the city limits, are, are they really free to worship? The city is destroyed. My wife and I were watching a show right now um, about Memorial Hospital during the days following Hurricane Katrina. And I, I have to say, if there is a modern-day example of the conditions these Israelites were facing, New Orleans, the days after that levee broke, is it. Can you imagine? No infrastructure, no safety, no resources, no communication with the outside world. Every man for himself. Chaos and total, complete destruction. Like, folks, we take so much for granted. Man, like, see, we, we don't have people threatening us for worshiping together. Now, we might have somebody come in here and be like, Josh, what do you say? Like, try to disrupt the service or something like that. But we don't have anybody threatening us for worshiping. Right? We don't have to wonder if this building is still going to be here next week. Like, we can gather without fear. What a gift that is. What a wonderful gift that is. We can be the church without worrying for our lives, right? And Israel just didn't have that opportunity. I just want you to think about that. I mean, what would it be like if we couldn't worship without the threat of being killed? You ever think about that? What would, what would it be like? What would it be like if, if we were constantly worried about which life group was going to get attacked this week? Can you imagine? So Nehemiah hears about this situation, and he's devastated. His heart breaks for God's people. Look at verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. He wept and mourned for days. I mean, Nehemiah was weeping for his city. He was weeping for the church. He was weeping for his God. Now, here's the thing. If you're doing the math here, you've, you, you've probably become a bit skeptical. Like, Josh, um, Nehemiah was living in Babylon this entire time, right? Yeah. Well, he just now heard that Babylon destroyed Jerusalem? Really? Like, there's, 
There's no way he's hearing this information for the first time. He had to have known. He served as the king's cupbearer. It had to be a conversation at some point. Like, come on. To which I'd say, you're right. Like, the information Nehemiah received just now is over 141 years old. Not exactly hot off the press. Not breaking news. You with me? Like, to fast and, 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 and to pray and to weep for days over something you already knew about? What's going on? Here's what I think happened. I think, it's my opinion, I think Nehemiah is actually hearing this news for the second time. Only this time, God has moved and opened Nehemiah's heart to be like his. To show concern. To be sad. To feel their pain. To feel their hardship. And to care for them. And know this, I don't think that that's a stretch. In fact, it's happened before. In fact, it happened before Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple. Look at this, Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Mm. Do you see that key phrase in those two verses? The Lord moved the heart of the king. Mm. Just like he would later move the heart of Nehemiah. Look at the rest of verse 4. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now we're going to look at Nehemiah's prayer today, but before we get there, I, I just want to make sure you don't miss this, okay? Nehemiah hears this, this terrible news, and he doesn't call his best friend. He doesn't blame his friends. He doesn't blame his king. He doesn't blame his country or even God. He sits quietly and feels their hurt. That's important. Like, he's not looking at the failures of the church and blaming the church for the way that it is. No, he's looking at the failures of the church, and he's allowing his heart to break for those who are harmed by those failures. Like, shed tears over the abuse. Shed tears over the false teaching. Shed tears over those that the church has hurt, and now those that hate the church because of that hurt. Break, let your heart break. See, I, I don't think that's our first reaction. Like, we have a tendency to point the fingers. All right, but Nehemiah, he's not pointing the finger. It's more like, what have we done? What have we done? And Nehemiah knows that a work needs to be done in himself before the work can be done on the wall. That's big. We don't do that. I'm I'm, we're not seeing that, right? We blame people. We love to blame. We blame Washington. You know, it's these politicians, right? We elect them, they get rich, and they forget who they represent, right? We need new ones. But then the new ones get in there and do it all over again. It's almost like there's something else that's wrong. See, our tendency is to blame others when what we should be doing is going to God and seeking Him. Look at this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Look at this. Another promise from God. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. You want so badly to point the finger at others. Look at what they're doing. They're wrong. Guess who God's pointing the finger at? You. Me. He's looking at us. And he's saying, what are you looking at? Me? Or them? Wow. We want our land to be healed, don't we? I said we want our land to be healed, don't we? I know I do. God makes it clear that if you want to see change in this country, 
then you need to start here. Right here. If you've been around church long enough, you've heard the, the lobby cliche, the church needs revival. Believers love to toss this one out, and yes, it's true. I'm not saying that it's not. The church needs revival, but last I checked, you're a part of the church, which means you need revival. I need revival. We need revival. See, God-driven change starts in a single heart. A single heart. Listen to me. I want you to hear this today. God can move in the hearts of kings and cupbearers. This is true. But he can move in your heart too. Ask him. Ask him to give you a new heart. Ask him to give you a heart like Jesus. Ask him to, to break your heart for what breaks his heart. And listen to me, he'll do it. You can lead like Nehemiah. You can love like Jesus. Just seek God first and he'll give you what you need. I love that, I love that Nehemiah gets emotional but takes his time. Did you notice that? Did you see that? I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I think a lot of us, a lot of us, we let our emotions really drive us to make hasty decisions, right? Am I the, I'm not the only one guilty of this. Oh, yeah. Like, we get emotional and we get texty, you know, or, or we start tweeting our disapproval or we take to Facebook comment section. We're like, I'm going to light this up. Not Nehemiah. See, he knows that the, his emotions need time. I'm guilty of running hot. I'll confess that to you. I'm guilty of running hot, and, and man, I can lash out real quick if I'm not careful. And I just want to challenge you. I want to challenge myself that the next time we get cornered, don't lash out. Don't point fingers or take to the Internet. Stop and pray. Don't even call your best friend first. Seek God's face. Seek him, and he'll give you what you need. Even fast if you must. We don't talk about this as much as we should, and, and maybe I'll fix that. I, I probably will, but r remind your mind and your body that they aren't king, that he is. Well, that's what fasting is. This seems like an appropriate time to let you know that Nehemiah is a prayer warrior. Okay, if you don't know that, now you do. This dude is worrying about nothing and praying about everything. And this prayer in, in, in chapter 1 here is his first and most lengthy prayer in this entire book. And before we read this, I want to tell you something that's really important about prayer. It's big that you get this. God is not a genie, and you ain't Aladdin. Can we just, yeah? Like this idea that God is like some cosmic charged pinata, and if you, just, if you just pray just the right way or, you know, at just the right time, then boom, piece of candy. No, it's not how it works. Prayer's simple, folks. God is our Father, and we are His children. Now, I know that not everyone grew up in the same environment that I grew up in, so I know sometimes God as Father is more difficult for some than others. I had an excellent man of God as a father, and so I'm grateful for that. But go with me here. My family, growing up, we talked about everything everything we talked it off and I've adopted this with my children I hated it when we were when I was growing up I hated it but now I'm using it right my kids know that they can talk to me I know that I can talk to my dad this is something this is like a generational shift for our family too like it's it's incredible and and so I don't I don't miss the dinner table unless I absolutely have to like I'm sorry you call me and I'm having dinner with my family face down if you really need something, I'll be there for you. I'm just saying, like, try not to interrupt dinner if you can't help it. But anyways, th so the same way, right, the same way that my kids can approach me, right, I can approach God. Because God loves us, and he'll talk to us anytime about anything. We, sure, we need to come with reverence, and we need to come with sincerity, and we need to come with confidence, but there's also freedom in that space. The other day, um, I was struggling. Some of you know about this. I was just, I was really having a tough week, and 
And I, I just talked to God while I was driving home that day. And the, I want you to know there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Like, I, it was actually an amazing time for me. An amazing time. Like, my prayers alone with God in my truck, out loud, right? They carry no less power than my prayers with you in this place. Like, just know this. God speaks to you through his word. You speak to him in prayer. If you ever feel like your prayer life is suffering, go back to his word and just keep working it. Let's look at this prayer in four parts. Okay, we got praise, repentance, requests, and devotion. Four parts, starting in verse five. Nehemiah says, Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. So Nehemiah starts his prayer how we should all start our prayers, with praise. And now the best way that I've heard this put is, is, is many of you have passwords, right? We live in an online world. You, hopefully you have passwords, you know. Uh, um, you have passwords for shopping. You have passwords for streaming. You have passwords for banking. You have passwords for everything. And hopefully it's not just all the same password. I'm just saying, like, if it is, you might want to go home and change that thing, all right? Just mix it up a little bit. And, and I know that we aren't supposed to share our passwords, but I think I'll make an exception here. The password to unlock a vibrant prayer life is thank you. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, God, for being holy and good. Thank you, God, for being sovereign. Thank you, God, for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for my sins. Thank you, God, for my family. Yes, thank you, God, for this meal. Thank you, God, for my friends. Thank you, God, for my church. Lord, thank you, God, for my bride. Thank you, God, for being awesome, as Nehemiah says. Like, thank you, God, for all that you've done. And, God, thank you for what you will one day do. Like, thank you, God, for your word that I may understand your love. Thank you, God, for your word that I may understand and see your mercy and your patience. Like, thank you, God, for difficult days even so that I might remember that it is not through my strength but through your strength in me. In all things, give thanks to the one who is faithful. Give thanks in all circumstances because the one you praise is worthy of praise. Thank you, God. Nehemiah isn't going to wait a week to schedule an appointment with a shrink. He knows that God's there anytime. And he's willing to talk to him. He's willing to encourage him. He's willing to weep with him and comfort him and love him. At the end of the day, Nehemiah just understands who God is. And that's why he's dependent upon him in prayer. And we'll see more in Nehemiah's prayer life throughout this series. In fact, I, I don't think you can read the book and ignore it. It's just everywhere. This dude is just praying. He's just stopping to ask for wisdom. He'll stop to ask for encouragement and help and strength. This dude prays continually. And some of his prayers are really short, and some are really long. In fact, let's talk about that. I, I love coffee. Any coffee lovers in here? Yeah? Like, seriously, that's all the coffee lovers? What is going on? My goodness. Vote, people. Um, so, so Nehemiah's prayer life, check it out, and, and just go with me here, okay? Nehemiah's prayer life has some K-cups and some whole bean, okay? I know, just go, okay? Sometimes Nehemiah just needs to send up a quick one, right? And, and, and you can too. I think you could be sitting at your desk at work, you could be driving home, and you could just feel tired and discouraged, and you just, in that moment, you can connect and just pause with the, and, and connect with the living God in that very moment. It could be 10 seconds. Just, and, and, and K-cups are good, right? And they're convenient, but, but you don't want to just have K-cups all the time or you'll forget how good the, the, the beans are. So, so go with me, guys. Speaking of whole bean, sometimes you just need to spend some significant time with God. Really let it sit, right? See, this is you 
taking time or maybe even just I'll, you stick with the example talking to him on your way home right but things are flowing so well and you're feeling so loved and cared for that, that you actually drive around the neighborhood a couple times to avoid being home not because you don't like your family but because you're afraid to disconnect from such an intimate and rich time with the Lord that's your whole being the slow drip you need to balance both K-cups and beans. And so first, Nehemiah gives praise to God. And then he moves into a time of repentance. And this is, this is awesome. Look at verse 6. It says, Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. Look at this. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my ancestral family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws that you gave your servant Moses. And if you've ever had confusion regarding exactly what repentance looks like, there it is. Nehemiah brings clarity here in the second part of his prayer. He confesses his sin. But not just that, he confesses the sin of his family, the sin of his ancestors, the sin of his church, the sin of an entire city, heck, the, the sin of an entire nation. Folks, this is so far from our culture, it almost looks insane. We're like standing up like, Nehemiah, what are you doing? This ain't your fault. What are you doing? You don't have to own that. You don't have to take that on yourself. You're, that, no, we're individuals, right? I'm an individual. I'm only accountable for me and what I do. I'm not accountable for you. Mm, but that's not how we're instructed to operate, folks. That's not how the church is instructed to operate. In fact, when Paul is instructing the churches in Corinth on how it's supposed to operate, he compares the church to a body. Look at what he says. If one part suffers... Every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. No believer left behind. You get that, right? That's how this is supposed to work. Nehemiah isn't pointing the finger. Well, they did it. It's, their, it's on them. It's their fault. No, he's showing humility and he's repenting of his own sin and their sin. He's saying, look, what, what have we done, God? Why? Because Nehemiah knows that he can't begin to work on others if he doesn't first let God go to work on him. Hmm. That sounds like something Jesus would teach, doesn't it? Oh, wait. It is. Matthew 7, verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in someone else's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from the other person's eye. If only we knew how ridiculous we looked. <laughs> We'd stop if we knew how horrible we looked. Look, look, what? Let me get that for you. Everyone wants to point the finger. Oh, it's the radical left or the radical right or the Republicans or the Democrats or the white or the black or the rich or the poor or the young or the old or the male or the female. We want to point. But the only way to point accurately is to point the finger at everyone, including yourself. Because last I checked, all, all, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us have anything to write home about. I love Nehemiah. I love him. He says, Lord, go to work on me so I can be part of your plan. <laughs> Use me, God. Use me. We need more of that. We need more of that. A, a, a church that preaches repentance but doesn't practice repentance can't gain ground for the gospel. You need to walk in it. A church that doesn't repent can't fully understand grace. You just can't. And Nehemiah, he leans heavy into grace, and we should too. His prayer time continues. Next, he leans into his requests. It's in verse 8. 
It says, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations, but if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if you're exiled or at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now look, you need to know here, Nehemiah knows him some Bible. Right? So, so he, he's praying. He's, he's recalling God's promises. And, and look, it's great because we're so spoiled, we can just look them up. To the unfaithful, God says in Leviticus, I will scatter you among the nations, and I will draw out my sword and pursue you. Your land will be laid waste, and your cities will lie in ruins. He said he'd do it. In Deuteronomy 30, God speaks to the faithful. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. This is what Nehemiah knows that you need to know too. How outsiders see God's people is how they see God. Whether it's an accurate picture of God is based on how you live. If God's people aren't Sacrificial. If God's people aren't walking in holiness, if they're not reading scripture, if they're not praying or worshiping or serving one another or their community, if they're, if they're not living transformed lives, then not only do they look bad, but they make God look bad. So there's really only one question to ask here. What do they learn about God when they gaze upon you? What do they learn about God when they gaze upon you? Repent and ask God to give you a new heart. Ask him to give you a heart like Jesus because you can't go to work out there unless you're willing to let him go to work on you in here. One more thing I want to quickly point out in part of this prayer. Why does Nehemiah quote scripture pretty much verbatim back to God? Like obviously God knows what he said, right? Like, God doesn't, God doesn't need a cupbearer to remind him of his promises, does he? No. Okay, he knows. It's because God delights when his people come to him with his word and claim hope in his promises. He loves it. God loves when we offer to him from what he's given us. In fact, in a few minutes, we're going to sing a song. Uh, in, in, in verse 3, there's this line, um, and I hope you smile when you sing it today. It goes like this, and I can't shake it from my mind. I love this song, and, and I hope you're ready for it. it. And from your hand, we give to you to make Christ known. That's the line. From your hand, we give. We're saying, God, I have nothing to give you apart from what you've given me. I believe your word. I, I trust your word. I, I, I'm leaning in. I might fall on my face, but I'll never let go of your promises. Let's look at the last part of Nehemiah's prayer. So he's given thanks. He's repented. He's made requests, and now he's committing himself to God. Check it out. It's beautiful. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Did you see that? Hear the prayer of your servants who delight in what? Revering your name. Revering your name. Folks, it's my prayer that God will raise up servant leaders in this church to teach the word to our young people, to our youth and our kids. Like we need faithful servant leaders to step in and help run a new program that we're launching this fall to help equip young kids with the truth about God. It's called Kids for Truth. And we're excited about it. In fact, we've said we said, we believe our culture is failing our children. And so instead of continuing to complain about it and bicker about it, we knew that we needed to do something about it. But we cannot do it without your help. And so, Lord, call men and women in this church to rise and build. Make a move in their heart today, Lord. We need more servants who delight in seeing God's name honored and glorified. And it's my prayer, folks, that, that, that seeing his name lifted high would be more delightful to you than, than a 
bigger paycheck or even a promotion at work. It's my prayer that seeing his name lifted high would be more delightful to you than anything this world could possibly offer you. God, I'm asking you, please raise up leaders like that. Raise up leaders in this church that don't get their thrill from the things of this world, but they get their thrill from seeing your name lifted high. I'd like to close a little different today. In fact, we're going to do a lot of things different today, so bear with us as we learn about these things um, all over again. <laughs> I'd like to close today by giving you a way to respond to what you've heard. In fact, uh, we've updated our serve page on our website to reflect some of our greatest needs, including the needs that we have for our new program, Kids for Truth. The growing church has needs. And we need people to step in and meet them. We need more Nehemiahs. The next generation, folks, they need more Nehemiahs. It's time to step up. It's time to step in. It's time to get to work. So please, go to the crossroads.church forward slash serve and become a servant leader today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your gentleness, Lord. As we seek your face, Lord, we get, we get distracted easy. We get pulled off in all these directions. And Lord, it's easy for us to take our eyes off you. But Lord, we're refocusing now. We're setting our gaze on you. And we're asking one question. What would you have of us? What do you require of us? Lord, we love you. We trust you. We commit our lives to you now. In your name.